to introduce the session, uh, Chris Davis from the University of South Florida, something like that. Indeed. Thank you, Alan. Got it right. Anyway, also chair of the IT for IT forum, and I will leave it to Chris to um, do the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a, a fantastic honor to stand here with these two documents in my hand. It's been my pleasure and honor to serve as a chair of the forum for the last year and a bit. And I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of where we are, where we were, and where, we, wh where we're going, and then hand over to Mary Jarrett. So in my hand, I have a small book that says Global Standards and Publications. And fairly soon, this pocketbook, the IT for IT Reference Architecture version 2, will be part of that. This is an enormous watershed moment for a very talented and very diverse team, many of whom are in the room with us today. So after my few brief words to explain exactly why this is such an important watershed moment, I hope that you'll connect with us over lunch and then join us this afternoon because we have three interesting presentations, one from Chris Armstrong, one from Lars Rossen at HP, and another one from Rob, Rob Akashok, building on the success stories, if you will, the potential that this new standard for the business of IT offers. So do please join us this afternoon. Mary Jarrett from Shell, who I'll introduce in a few moments, will also join us in the panel at the end of the day. So we've got a really interesting series of presentations for you. So I hope I can advance the slides. I'm pressing the right button, Martin. Is that what I should be pressing? So the governing board has approved the IT for IT reference architecture version two including the addition to the standards information base. And I'm just gonna move to my notes because I put some algebra up there just to, to puzzle you. Um, this is a strategic planning tool, he said dropping his notes, that was used in Citibank for many years. W cubed, where we were. This was just a small customer consortium a few years ago, a very active but very passionate customer and vendor um, organizations who had a vision to fill the space in the standards world with something that would support the business of IT. Where we are now, we began working with the Open Group in 2013. As some of you will remember, we launched publicly in London in October last year. To date, some 15 to 20 man years of effort has gone into this initiative. W cubed to B, where do we want to be? We see the opportunity for the new standard to bring coherence into the often chaotic world of running enterprise scale IT departments. And in doing so, we think that we're helping to make the world just a little bit of a better place. GT squared, that's where Mary comes in. In a few minutes, we'll hear from Mary at Shell. Later, colleagues from Delta Lloyd and Armstrong Process Group will highlight the business value and potential of the new standard. GT squared means, are we going to get there? You betcha, we are. I'd like now just to share a slide that um, Lars Rossen put together, which explains the abstractions and connections in this reference architecture. The reference architecture itself sits at level three in this five le level model. Um, if you decompose it downwards, if we continue to abstract, we go down through levels four and five into something which is vendor and then highly tool specific in terms of logical architecture. So the support for detailed design by the worker bees in the vendor and service provider organizations is now there. This is the first time there's been such prescriptive guidance and it's a very exciting moment. The other perspective is that we can abstract outwards, we can zoom out to a helicopter view which provides guidance through four value streams up into what we call the IT value chain. This is immediately familiar to executive sponsors who see a perspective of this reference architecture that enables them to latch onto and identify the business value that this new standard presents. We 
think that this will be immediately sensible to many people in many organizations like Shell, Delta Lloyd, and elsewhere. This, for me, though, is the most exciting piece. Support for enterprise architects in the standard is very substantial indeed, but significantly, it's process agnostic. The standard can be used to drive structured and agile projects and teams in combination if desired. The standard brings prescriptive guidance into a space which until now has been characterized by the variety of process, project, and organizational frameworks and the resources it populated. The IT for IT reference architecture provides a cohesive data model and component prescriptions and enables the efforts of all to plan, build, run, broker, integrate, operate, to be choreographed and coordinated in a less ad hoc fashion. This is the direct support for worker bee enterprise architects that has for so long been absent. We have, at last, made shoes for the cobbler's children. We now have something which is much more useful than an M8 wrench. There's still much to be done to develop the collateral that will help cement the standard in place. We're working on training, certification, product validation, but we also need help to work at a more detailed level to provide guidance on what data to exchange at the attribute level. But the potential is huge. The standard provides firm foundations, and we hope that you will help us build from it. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Mary Jarrett, who I hope will follow what I just presented and demonstrate that potential. Our speaker is Mary Jarrett from IT for IT at Shell. As a professional accountant, Mary specialized in UK and international tax for over a decade. In 2001, she joined Shell working in retail fuel card operations, optimizing management information and transaction systems and running a pan-European team. Since deciding to move to IT, she's developed strategies and plans and set up a continuous improvement team in the global IT services organization. Currently, she has a dual role running a multi-million dollar IT portfolio whilst leading an enterprise-wide IT cost optimization program. In this session, Mary will be explaining why Shell is adopting an open standard for managing IT. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Jarrett. I'm going to leave that there just in case I forget. Do you have the clicker? I do. That's a very generous introduction. Thank you. Congratulations if you spotted that's not me there. <laughs> Congratulations if you spotted it was me on the marketing material. I don't have any particular desire to keep my hair the same from month to month. It is a great honour to be asked to be speaking to you on this auspicious day. This is the day where we've launched the standard and it's been a long journey. It's been a long journey in Shell, and it's been a long journey for a lot of you out there. And I think it's a really important day to mark. Before I get into it, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me. Um, you've already heard, I, I don't have a long background in Shell, and I don't have a long lifetime background in IT. So I may be an unusual person to be talking about IT for IT. But let's see where that takes us. I'm not the only one from Shell here today. I, there's many people, many suppliers who've helped us on this journey, but there's one person in particular that I'd like to mark out. He is my chief architect, and he has taught me everything I know about this topic. Carol, I'm going to ask you to stand up. He needs to have the credit. <laughs> you also need to make sure you recognize that guy, because you've got a difficult question. That's where it goes. OK, so I said, my, I, I make my life 50-50-50. So I spent 50% of my career inside Shell, 50% outside Shell. You've heard, I'm an accountant. I'm going to give you an accountant's view of what IT does through this presentation. And for those of you who report to the CFO, maybe that will be enlightening. I spent 50% of my career inside Shell, so that's the last 50%, 
50% of it inside IT and 50% of it outside IT. I worked in our downstream operations before I moved into IT. So it does give me a different perspective. Could you just put your hands up if you read and agree to that, please? <laughs> I'm sorry, how many times do you click I accept on random websites and you're not willing to just accept this? Don't worry, it just tells you that if I talk about reserves, I don't really mean to talk about reserves. So what am I going to do today? I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the environment. I'm going to tell you quite a lot about Shell, because Shell's very important to me. I'm going to tell you what IT for IT is. I'm going to tell you why it's important and why it's difficult. I'm going to tell you about our Shell IT for IT journey, because I like to make things practical. I don't like to stay too much at the conceptual level. And then I'm going to put the ball firmly back into your court before lunch to see what you think you're going to do next. You never know, we might have time for questions, but I doubt it. So where are we? That's pretty impressive. That's one of my favorite shell pictures. But I'm not going to tell you just about that just yet. I want to start here, before we get into the weeds, the back office of IT for IT, down there in the trenches behind everything, remind ourselves, why are we here? We are here because IT adds value to businesses. It increases profitability of businesses. It increases revenue. It opens new, new worlds for business. That is why IT is here. I'm just going to tell you in the context of IT for IT. Let me tell you about Shell. We're an integrated oil and gas company. You probably all know what that means. It means we find the oil, we dig it up, extract it would be the technical jargon. We refine it and we sell it on. What you probably don't know is how complex that might be. Did you know, for instance, that we refine nearly double what we produce and we sell nearly double what we refine? There's an awful lot of trading of this oil commodity that goes on in between, making this a very complex hydrocarbon management system that IT needs to support. Shell has innovation and technology at the core of its strategy. And I'll get to this soon. We actually use innovation and technology to find more oil, to actually extend the useful life of our production platforms, to enhance our profitability by making our refining and our extraction processes more efficient, and we actually use it to find new oil and new growth areas, things like really deep under the sea on the ocean floor, we call deep water, or integrated gas. This here, Prelude, this here is a floating liquefied natural gas plant. It is the biggest floating object in the world. It is 146 meters longer and six times heavier than the biggest aircraft carrier. <laughs> it is the length of four football pitches, football being very close to my heart, and that's the height comparison you can see there. It took five times more steel to build this than it took to build the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And when it's live, it will produce 3.6 million tons of LNG every year, as well as some other byproducts. And most importantly, it's normally moored off Western Australia, not Westminster. So, as a big user of technology, Shell is also an IT intense company. And we're also very big, which also creates IT issues. So we run our businesses as global businesses, not local businesses. So it's not a question of getting performance and insight of retail in Italy. No, we run all of our businesses as global businesses. We need global systems giving global performance, giving global insights and automating global processes. We have 94,000 people spread across the world. Some in hospitable parts of the world like Edinburgh and some in less hospitable parts of the world. And the IT challenges even go as far as providing onboard entertainment to offshore platforms. So it's large. When, when I joined Downstream, or oh, 15 years ago nearly, um, one of the facts that I liked most about Shell was that we've sold more sandwiches than Tesco's. It's not just about hydrocarbon management. Our IT requirements are more akin to a conglomerate they, than they are to a single company. All that business complexity, perhaps not un, uh, unexpectedly, 
leads to a huge IT landscape. This is what we're managing inside Shell. And I just reflect on this. And it used to be that if you wanted to be a successful CIO, all you had to do is go and throw your wallet on the table, say, I manage this much budget, and look at this IT that I manage. But that's not so anymore. To be a successful CIO, companies are now looking for you to be a business leader. They're looking to you to manage your IT and actually manage it in an agile manner. Use market services. Don't build up all this capital in all that IT investment. They're looking to you as the CIO to actually make sure your IT is affordable, not big, not impressive. Some of these stats here and some of the budgets that we spend are becoming a bit more of an embarrassment than a matter of pride. And we need to actually start thinking, do we need to manage our, our business better? Of course, it's not just Shell. There's that high, whole IT industry thing going on as well. And I'm sure you recognize all these disruptive uh, elements in there. And yes, OK, so all of these need to be managed differently. And I will come back to that later in this presentation. But it also changes people's attitude to IT. How many times do you go back into the office and you hear people going, well, that's nice, but can I have it on my iPad, please? Or they go, what do you mean I have to wait six months for your change window? Can't you just spin it up in that cloud thing that you use these days? Or why you ask me to clean my email inbox? I get 20 gigabytes free when I go home and do this. Our, the attitudes to IT are changing, and we need to adapt. And then, as Shell, we've always been, um, you know, we've always been attacked, shall I say, by activists. So we have Greenpeace scaling our buildings, leaving blow-up polar bears outside our doors. But now, unfortunately, they've become hacktivists. And so we have to protect our cyber back door as well as our physical front door. And then there's the commercial pressures. The commercial pressures. Have you seen the oil price recently? I don't think I need to say any more. Managing within all of these pressures, the external ones, the internal ones, the attitude, the new, the new role that the CIO's got to play, who would want to be a CIO today? It's a really new role and it's really hard. Well, aren't you the lucky ones? I'm here to tell you how IT for IT can help. It's a bit like saying, I'm here from head office, I can help. And I actually really believe that IT for IT can help you with all of these issues. Think, how big is your IT department? Think of your budget right now. What if you ran your own business and that was your revenue in your first year? I'd be pleased, <laughs> I'm telling you. Would you run your business without full insight into what's going on? Would you not want to know how efficient you're running, that you're optimizing your investments, you're running at the lowest cost possible to actually um, make your profits as high as possible? And yet when we come back in to IT, we don't actually run it like that. So why don't we run it like that? Why don't we run it like a business? And just sit back again. Most organizations spend between 1% and 4%, 1 to 4% of revenue on IT. That makes the IT departments of larger corporates mid-level stock exchange company size. One of those embarrassing facts, if I look at it at Shell, Shell IT, just the IT department alone, would be FTSE 100 listed. We would be a smallish country in GDP terms. That's how large it is. And it's not just large, it's complex. Remember the stats I showed you? There's lots of IT out there, there's lots to manage. And it's not just complex, it's critical. If it goes wrong, Shell can't talk to customers, Shell can't find more oil. Shell is an operating complicated plant, like I showed you. So it's big, it's complex, and it's critical, and we're not managing it like a business. Why don't we do that? Why don't we run it with full insight and full automation across the life cycle of IT? As an accountant, I can tell you I spent my early career putting in small accounting systems for small businesses. Even small businesses wanted insight into their performance, and they knew that manual wasn't going to hack it for them. Larger businesses, you go and audit larger businesses as an accountant, it's all done in IT systems. You don't audit people, you go and look at their IT systems. You can see all of their processes.
processes and all of their insights. We've had one suggestion why we don't do that, which is cobbler's children. If you're British, you might understand that. Let me just make sure we all understand that. Cobbler's, old English language for shoemaker. Cobbler's children have no shoes. Maybe in IT we spend all of our time looking at our business IT and not at our own IT. I think there's more to it. So let's focus a bit. What is this IT for IT? What would managing the business of IT look like if we did it well? So it's, it's not rocket science. We need to plan stuff, we need to build it, we need to deploy it, we need to operate it. If we start acting like business people, we might even decommission it every now and then. But let's not get too excited too early. And we need IT systems, IT capabilities throughout that. And we do. We have investment planning, investment prioritization systems in the planning. We have requirements and testing systems for building. We have a service catalog for deploying. And we have monitoring and ticketing systems for operating, to name but a few. We're good at that. We can put IT capabilities in. It's in our name. We're IT. We're IT for IT, even better. But do we get the most out of those systems? If you're going to run IT like a business, you don't just deploy IT, you use it. You look at it, you see what it's telling you, you take actions as a result of what it's telling you about the performance of your massive operations called IT. Can you honestly, hand on heart, say, well, I know exactly what each element in that life cycle cost me, how well they're performing, what risks I'm taking and what mitigations I have in place, and what value I'm creating in each step of my life cycle. That is what you should be able to say. You should be able to say, hand on heart, I plan to deliver you this value, and I know that I have, because in operations, my systems tell me I'm delivering you that value. You should be able to do that. You should be able to identify why, when projects go live, you have incidents in operations. We all know they do. You should be able to identify which teams or which suppliers put, put projects in and make the changes without creating those incidents, and which ones create them. And you should identify why that's different, improve your process, and even better, you should reward the people who do that well. I bet you any money you all reward a project going live. You go, yes, this is great, let's celebrate. Why don't you reward the ones that don't create operational incidents and reward the ones that create the value they always said they'd promised? Why don't you change your way of thinking and manage like business people? And let me tell you, I, I'm now this is a personal opinion about why do we get ourselves here? Why don't we manage IT like that? Well, one, we have tools. We have lots of tools. We have so many tools that it's almost impossible to manage. And why wouldn't we? This is IT for IT. You've got IT people speaking to IT people. You've got a problem, what are you going to do? You're going to put IT in. And there's another problem. The IT we put in, the IT we put in is a point solution. It's a point solution for a particular department that happens to have the problem. So you, you'll have a planning team, and they'll put in a point solution for their planning. And you've got development teams, and you'll put in point solutions for development. And you've got an operations team, and you'll put in a point solution for operations. Stop and think for a minute. If you did want to manage the whole life cycle, end to end, whose responsibility would that be in your company today? Who would actually own that budget? We stepped back in Shell, and actually nobody owned that budget, which gave us the real problem. And so that's something that Carol and I are fighting all the time, trying to get people to understand that optimizing the end to end is going to add more value than putting more tools in. And here's my personal favorite. We have a culture in IT that doesn't allow us to do this. We accept that people just complain about the tools and don't do something with it. How many times have I heard, well, I'm sorry, your system doesn't have good data quality. I'm not going to take any action on the costs that you're telling me are there. Or, I need a new report in this tool. Until you build me a report, I can't do anything. And yet there's tons of data and information we're already supplying to them. They'll do anything to blame the tool rather than taking the information and take an action. And then if you do want to join it all up, let's say you did want a total cost of ownership of an application, which requires pieces from all of it, we accept in IT that somebody who needs to do that will go to their PC, they'll get it all downloaded from all the different systems, they'll get in their Excel spreadsheet, they'll do all the pivot tables, and I can guarantee you whatever they come up with will support their point of view. Simply no objectivity, and we accept that. And here's the kicker. We hide behind excuses. 
excuses that we all believe in. Honestly, we all say, well, when we make that change, we, we had an incident, we didn't expect it to happen because IT is so complex, we didn't know what was going to impact. And we all go, yeah, we know that. That, that happens. And we accept it. Or we go, well, we delivered late because the customer kept changing their requirements. I had to keep changing scope. And we accept that. And we never look underneath that to see what our underlying inefficiencies are in IT. Just think, what do you think would happen if the CFO went to the CEO and said, I'm sorry nobody's paying your invoices, I sent them all out incorrectly, but I'll tell you why. It's because master data is so complex, so I can't really manage it. And because the data in our systems isn't of very good quality, and I can't do anything about that either. And actually, the customer kept changing their minds on what they was going to order, so that really confused the whole process. That CFO isn't going to be there for long, and yet the CIO has been making those excuses for a lot of years. That is not going to be around for long as the CIO has to step up as a business leader. So where are we in business terms? The top of this slide says the business wants more IT, more quickly, more efficiently, with better quality. And the other side says we want it at lower cost and less risk. You know the story. They've always wanted that. They still want it today. They're always going to want it. So even if you sat there and went, actually, my IT for IT works pretty well, it might work well for now. Will it work well tomorrow? And down the bottom, I'm going to show you how I've got into IT culture now. I'm going to start right to left, and my excuse is somebody else did these slides for me. On the right, you've got all those new technologies, those disruptive emerging technologies. You need new management systems to manage those. Have you thought about that? You're going to have more and more suppliers from the cloud that you're going to have to manage. They're not going to come in and use your traditional ticketing system. You're going to have more and more devices that you need to manage, know where they are, know how much they cost, as mobile proliferates and Internet of Things comes along. Those more and more devices will have more and more connects to the outside world. You're not, your traditional perimeter security is not going to hack it for long. And all of those connections are going to lead you to more and more cyber threats, all of which need managing, finding, identifying, and repelling. Have your, are your management systems up to that? In the middle here, I'm sure we've all stated we're going agile, we're going bimodal, DevOps, that's our next step. Have you thought what that means to your management system? Do you realize that that information, that boundary of information between your dev team and your ops team has to disappear? We have to pass information through that life cycle and we have to pass it quickly. Have you thought what it means to have security, architecture, finance embedded in your agile process instead of at stage gate two and stage gate six where they can pop in and pop out again? It's an entirely different paradigm that you've got to manage. And here on the left, oh, that old chestnut, hey? Costs keep rising in base. If you can't keep going up, you're going to squeeze out your project investment. Honestly, what's the point of having an internal IT department if you can't invest in value? Why would your company even keep you? And so if you haven't got a deep and detailed insight into your costs of all of your assets, how are you going to manage that problem? And this is what IT for IT has been structured to do. We've called it a reference architecture. It's not just a set of documents. It's not just for architects. There's a real philosophy behind it. And the philosophy is underpinned by thoughts such as, we are going to transform the IT, the corporate IT world from an owner of data centers into a broker of services. We will need and we are going to create a single common data model across the whole life cycle of IT to help us manage it as a life cycle. We will have integrated capabilities across the life cycle and not just point solutions. And we will be able to exchange the right level of information with our growing ecosystem of suppliers. So if, if any of those issues struck home, and if you're like me, you'd probably be sitting there going, yeah, I can get that. Yeah, I'm going to have to change. God, 
that's going to cost a lot of money. Who on earth is going to invest in IT for IT? How, what on earth is the business value of that? How am I going to justify that spend? Well, we've done some work with Gartner. And Val Schreiber of Gartner, he says, if you get this back office IT for IT stuff right, you could save between 5 and 20% of your IT budget. Let me let that sink in. If you do this internal plumbing at the back, all that ticketing, monitoring, portfolio management, all that stuff that you go, yeah, yeah, internal plumbing, if you get that right, you could take 5 to 20% off your entire IT budget. Interested now? Do you want me to go back a few slides so you can catch up? No time, sorry. It wouldn't be right for me to stand up here on this auspicious day without showing at least a bit of the open group reference architecture, a bit of the open standard. You've seen it before, this is a value stream, slightly different um, format. The point of me making this is I really, really want to stress that it's the integrated nature of running IT that's going to get you the value. It's about that real value of IT, remember those systems that we're talking about. It might be 3D seismic for me in my upstream business, visualizing seismic reservoirs in 3D. It might be managing tankers and having distribution systems that actually get tankers to the retail sites on time. But it's about taking those ideas from concept through build into deploy and then into operate as a single value chain and being able to track it through that life cycle. I need you to really think, do you have this capability today? We often sit there behind closed doors and we think we have the capability. And that's my challenge to you today. Company size of Shell, I don't have this capability today. But I do believe I really need it. I need it to become better. You can take that as higher quality. I need it to become faster, more agile, would be the, the nicer word of saying it. I need it to become cheaper or more affordable, as the slide says. And I need it to reduce my risk. Without full insight across my whole life cycle, I can't make the performance of IT any better. If I don't manage it like a business, it won't ever get any better. So I promised you practical. So I'm now going to tell you about what we're doing about this. That was a bit of the lecture, a bit of the, the conceptual story bit of celebrating that we've got to an IT for IT open standard. And I'm going to start by reflecting. This is a bit of a, a hybrid slide. Um, you can see the top two from the left-hand corner, that, that shell, and the rest of it is really a story of how we got to this open standard. And I want to reflect here because there was a choice. We didn't have to go open standard, but we chose to in shell. And I want you to understand why. I want you to understand whether it's relevant to you or not. And it's because we have some certain core beliefs. And one of them is we've been managing this IT for IT actually formally as a department for just under a decade in Shell. And Carol will tell you he's been working at it through other departments for an awful lot longer than that in Shell. And we only see the gap between what we need to do and our current capabilities growing as all this disruptive environment comes upon us. We also see that the problem is really, really big, and the value of solving it is really, really big, and therefore, we want it solved, and we don't believe it's a, it's a problem that one company can solve by themselves. At the end of the day, we're an energy company, not an IT company. Probably not ours to solve anyway. And, we, and as an energy company, we don't mind if we do IT for IT the same way as everybody else does it. It's not a competitive advantage to us. And we really believe we can accelerate our journey by collaboration. We believe bringing in the expertise of others will get us there faster. And then the last one, we believe this solution will only work if it brings value, like reducing costs of overall IT budget for a consumer of IT like Shell, and also is commercially viable for suppliers. So it's really important that the collaboration is across the consuming and the supplying organization. That's the only way. It's
slide. I want to show you this, and I wanted to show you it without smartening up. I've used this roadmap for the last three years. It's very much built on the concept of the reference architecture. We may have come first before that, but then, as I told you, we had one of the leaders of the open group working for us. It also shows you how much Shell loves acronyms. And I'm sure you're all sitting there going, oh, I wonder if I can get, and normally I sat here and go, does anybody know what I mean? But I won't, I'll tell you. Apex, bottom left-hand corner. Application portfolio excellence. It was an early win. We, we built a trusted source of all of our applications and their major attributes. Slim, software license management. You can steal it, we haven't patented it. It's a nice, nice acronym. We've built a compliance capability. Moving up that line there, IoT, you should probably all know that one, Internet of Things. And then up the roadmap, ITBM, IT Business Management. And above that PPM, you all know Project Portfolio Management. Unfortunately, it's a real misnomer on this slide. I'll tell you about that. And so we built this roadmap in Shell. And actually, we've put it in this particular order. And at the moment, mainly we are following this order. But the order is really unimportant to us. Let me just make sure you all understand what the steps are. So the first step, IT business management, is about cost transparency. It's about providing the total cost of ownership for an application. It's also about insight about the whole cost, but the focus on applications. I have a slide about that. The next slide is about integrated portfolio management, life cycle portfolio management. It's about getting that insight into the cost, value, performance, and risk across the whole life cycle. I'm in the throes of that at the moment, and I've got a slide about that. And then the next three steps, these you can almost lie totally onto the, um, value, uh, the value stream from the reference architecture. The first one, let's get them in the right order, project delivery, automating project delivery. It's about making your project delivery predictable. Have you ever thought about that? Predictable in the length of time it's going to take and predictable in the quality it's going to bring. If you can automate project delivery more than we do today, you can make it predictable. You could really reduce waste and really make your life much better. It will also enable agile and DevOps, and that's where that piece is. The next one, operations efficiency. This is really about the um, uh, request to fulfill piece. It's about allowing somebody to go in, find what they want in the catalog, requesting it and automating the fulfillment, whether that's a PC or whether it's a technical IT landscape in the cloud or on legacy, just automating that whole process. Then at the top, we called it proactive, is the detect to correct uh, part of the value stream. Today, in our business critical landscape, we always monitor the applications, and whenever we detect something that might be going wrong, we automatically send it to our ticketing system so the, the support group is aware and can go work on it. But what if we could automate the fix instead of the ticket? That's what this work stream's about. I said, the order's not that important. We, del we deliver on this opportunistically. As investment funds come up, we'll work on any area of, of this, this roadmap. The important thing about it is to go and talk to people about it. It's quite inspirational for people to go out and hear, actually, that is what we want. Actually, that is really going to help our IT organization. It helps them think of IT for IT as a value add rather than internal plumbing. It does beg the question, what has IT for IT ever done for you? Obviously, no Monty Python fans. So let me talk about a couple of things we did. First of all, IT business management. Um, it's all about cost transparency. Why did we call it IT business management? Well, because it's, it's part of our journey. It's our first step on our journey to delivering or managing IT as a business. The top picture here, we have very good evidence in Shell that the prices we pay for IT, top quartile, we leverage our strength and our size and we pay top quartile prices. Our total IT cost, not so good. There's only one logical conclusion. We got too much of it. We're paying the right prices, but we got too many applications, too much infrastructure, maybe too many people in high-cost locations supporting IT. Who knows? I do now, but I didn't then. I was set the task. Can you go and give us cost transparency at an application level that will help us optimize our application costs and our application portfolio? And so we did. And so now what we can see, I'll just give you a flavor, 
what we can see is for, for every application, you can now see all of the contracts that support that application. They may be SaaS contracts, they may be licensed license contracts, maybe support contracts. You can see all of the support, all of the people who support that application. You can see how senior they are, you can see whether they're shell staff, contract staff, uh, where they're located, where in the world, onshore, offshore. You can see all of the projects that are being done on that application, so you can see how often it needs fixing. And you can see all of the infrastructure at the very detailed level and the cost of each piece of infrastructure. Now, when we did that, we found a whole load of integrations that really didn't work, and which is the point of this story for you, really, is to show this reference architecture is real, this integration is real. So we found a whole bunch of integrations that just didn't exist. We didn't have contracts linked to applications. We didn't have people linked to applications. We didn't even have projects linked to applications. We had to build that. They were just missing. We had a whole bunch of data quality, config management. Who doesn't have data quality issues in config? Yeah, it's a bit like ticking the box at the beginning, isn't it? Everybody has data quality issues in config. Nobody can link their infrastructure to their applications and keep it good. I can tell you, one of the great things about building this is there's now a reason to keep that good. Because if it's not, it goes out on a data quality piece that says your, your, cost, your costs are wrong because you haven't linked all your infrastructure to your applications. I've built a virtuous circle. And the other thing that's slightly more embarrassing, um, there was a whole load of conflicts in my integrations. So in all the systems that I had to put into here to make it work, they all grouped applications, projects in different ways. They all had different IT hierarchies. They all had different definitions of portfolios. So even if I wanted to, I couldn't have got my spreadsheet out and added all these things together because they just didn't hit. And so we had to introduce a whole new agreed IT hierarchy. And so here's our first step, getting deep and detailed insight into the cost of our applications by integrating our solutions. I've spent the last two years of my life doing that. Um, I now had, I had a couple of evenings back, so I thought, what shall I do next? Oh, well, let's go for integrated portfolio management. And so I'm now in the throes of this. And what is this? Well, up until now, we've managed portfolio management as three separate pieces of this triangle. Investment portfolio management got managed by the planners. Project portfolio management got managed by delivery. Application portfolio management, well, got managed by anybody who happened to think they'd like to do that. And we've now, just recently, brought it under one governance, one exec, the whole integrated portfolio management. I told you earlier, Apex was an early win. That's our system used for application portfolio management. I'm right now going live across our group with project portfolio management in the same system. Next year, I have money to pathfind putting investment portfolio management in the same system. I'm using a bit of an SAP strategy. I'm forcing integration by use of a single system for what would have normally been point solutions. That was the IT talk. Let me tell you the business value that I expect to get from this. I really believe this is going to improve the productivity in the IT department. It's going to massively reduce risk and give us more control of what we're doing. And let me give you some examples of how I think that's going to happen. So what I'm what I intend to do, as part of our cost transparency, we've already identified end of life on all of our infrastructure because it was a necessary part of that data model. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to automate, every time a piece of infrastructure comes to an end of life, I'm going to automate its end of life day into an application roadmap. Not an infrastructure roadmap, an application roadmap. And when that end of life is appearing, I'm going to automate that into the proposed investments for that year. Nobody gets to say, it's just going to stand there. And then the people who make decisions whether to invest or not can either say, yes, I'm going to fund it, or no, I'm not. If I do this enough, the chances are, yes, they're going to fund it, because they get used to the idea. And then I've mitigated the risk of end of life across my whole company. If they don't decide to fund it, I'm not going to go and say, you must fund it. No, I'm going to take it as a gift, and I'm going to say, here you go, operations team. This is all the end of life issues that you're going to have next year. You don't need to go and set up a project to do that, to find it out. It's here. It's reported. Some deep and detailed insight into what we're doing. Something else that I expect this to do. I'm, of course, I'm going to prioritize my investments by value. Who wouldn't? But I want to do more than that. I want to go the step further. I want that business case to live with that investment through its whole project stage and into operations. And I want to prove that the value that was promised was actually delivered. I am going to track that down to the last dollar of profitability, the 
all the productivity measures I can. Our value doesn't have to be defined purely in dollar values, it can be defined in KPIs, and we're going to track it to the end until we've actually delivered it. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make our future base costs predictable. We know that if our base costs keep going up, we'll squeeze out investment and we get into trouble with the, with the CEO. We don't want that to happen, but we don't know exactly when it's going to happen or what's going to happen. By doing this, I can make my future base costs predictable. I already have cost transparency of what, what it costs me today. I have business cases for investments which tell me how much they expect that to cost. And we also have rules in project portfolio management that every project must report its base cost impact and keep that up to date. And so by using that pieces of data in my integrated system, I can predict my future base costs. And I can use that to actually improve my performance and make sure I have money available for investment. Of course, the best value for this ever is IT is going to be able to use all this data, all this insight, and go and have excellent conversations with their business partners about the cost, the value, and the risk of the IT that that business uses. So that's my story. It's over to you. I'm not doing too badly. What are you going to do? What's your next step? Did you believe it? Did you not believe it? Do you need more information? There's plenty of stuff going on this afternoon to go and get more belief. There's already over 40 members of the forum, the IT for IT forum in the open group. You might be one of them or you might not. So maybe if you're not, maybe your first step is to join. If you are a member, what have you done about it? What are you planning to do about it? I gave you my, my story. I think there's a three-step model that you can go do now. You can go back. You can start doing a gap assessment of what you do today against the reference architecture. So you know where your gaps are. You can then stand back and say, where are your pain points? What's hurting you most? The lack of cost transparency was hurting us most. That's where we started. The next pain point I have is value and being able to prove value. So that's why I'm into integrated portfolio management. So where are your pain points? And then build a business case. I assure you there's a business case there. Go think, go think long and hard about how you justify that business case. And then get on with it. I'd like to thank you all for your patience, for listening to this. I think we may have time for questions if we want to do questions. But I want you to remember one thing. If you take only one thing away, the difficult questions to Carol, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. That was wonderful. Very good. Super. Thanks for letting me do. Okay, so we've got three or four minutes before we go to lunch. So just to re-articulate, we have a, a, a panel session this afternoon. Um, at the end of the afternoon, three presentations beforehand, and then Mary will rejoin us for the panel. So there'll be an opportunity to explore the issues and respond to questions then, but we'd be happy to take one or two now, just before we go to lunch, if that suits Alan. Two, and we'll see how much time we've got for either, okay? Okay, there's So go. the first one is, how do you plan to incent, measure, and govern the behaviour of people across the uh, organisation to support your roadmap projects? I, I think that's more for one over a, a glass of wine this evening. It's really hard. Go on, people. They, it, it's really hard. But we've made some progress. Uh, Carol and I worked really, really hard to get some of this done. But we've got Apex done, we've got Slim done, we've got the total cost of transparency done. The most important thing that enabled us to do that was to get the CIO on board. The single most important thing. Then you need to evangelise. You need to talk not in processes and data. You need to talk in business value. You need to say, what can somebody do better if they help you do this? The other question is pretty similar. It's, you spoke about tracking value from investments. How do you track how well or badly users actually use the systems and services and, and in so doing realise value? <laughs> Same question, right? It, it, it's, again, it's really how do we know we got value? We, we have a layer of our organisation called business interface. You might have a similar kind, a kind of role in your IT department. What do you use those people for? Do they too often just become that awkward interface that actually says, IT said this, or no business said that? No, what that business interface really ought to be doing, they ought to be doing exactly that. They should be out there, arm in arm with their business partners. They should be knowing exactly how those business people are using that system. They should be looking at it, analyzing it. Are they getting as much value as they should? Are they using all the functionality? Finding out why, finding it, making that possible. So there is a role in IT that should be doing that for you. Okay, I think this question might be answered this afternoon, Chris. Okay. Um, 
for IT adoption for IT organisations. IT for IT adoption for IT organisations. IT organisations. ITIL organisations. Yeah. Okay. So we have the pocket guide published. There is an appendix in the pocket guide that makes comparisons between IT for IT, the new open standard, and the various other tools and frameworks that are out there. This doesn't compete, but it definitely complements. I think that some of the structures and opportunities that it offers, huge organizations like Shell, is clear from Mary's presentation. But again, that's one that needs some reflection because ITIL, like many other frameworks, is effectively locally interpreted. So there are many, many flavors of implementation of that framework. So I think the pocket guide is the way forward there in terms of reflecting on how this fits into and fills some of the void in the standards landscape. There's a great opportunity for trainers to upgrade people from IT to IT. Absolutely. IT. So the, the, the normative piece that the standard offers provides some cohesion and I think it responds to that earlier question too. So in terms of what the standard brings into the organization, I think as well as being <coughs> able to evangelize to your CIO, it actually gives a sense of, if you will, belonging and belief to the whole IT function within a diverse organization. And that cohesion also can be built on by the trainers and the integrators so that you've got much more ability to drive the margins that we talk about in the value chain and achieve the sorts of wins that Mary's explained this morning. But yes, we will get into that a little bit more this afternoon in the track sessions, and certainly we can respond to that a bit more fully in the panel session at the end of the afternoon. And I'll just say, I'm here all day, and I'm here for dinner overnight, so if anybody wants to get into a conversation about this, I'm fully available. Just make sure he gets the difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> Put on the spot again. La last one. And I'd have trouble with this one as well because it depends. The answer is it depends. How did you quantify business value? We're going through that process at the moment. I'm not going to say we've solved this. Um, my, my external relations people would like me to stand up on stage and say, Shell has solved every problem <laughs> that's ever known to man. Unfortunately, it's not true. So we are. We have a massive program on that at the moment. I alluded to it. Um, you have choices. You can go 